What do mathematicians do? I love this picture of a mathematician at work. <laughs> the isolator, the author in his private study, outside noises are eliminated and the worker can concentrate with ease on the subject at hand. Of course, all maths is not like that. We think about beautiful things as well. There's some soap bubbles which make a fantastic um, pattern and we can uh, think about those patterns and how they arise. Um, I wondered what to talk to you about. There's lots of fantastic things that have come from maths and computers and data. The internet, Google, TomToms, sequencing the human genome, all these kinds of things. But I think it's always good disaster sells well, and my wife said I should start with some explosions. So let's have a look at some rocket science. Uh, in 1991, on the 28th of February, um, there was a US Army base. It was the middle of the Gulf War in Dharan. And uh, they, the people were getting ready for bed, and they were sure that they were OK because their base was protected from Scud missiles by the Patriot, the Patriot Revolution in Air Defence. Uh, unfortunately, a Scud missile sa sailed straight through the air defence mechanism. But why? Now, to do that, we, to understand that, we have to look deep inside a computer. A computer can only store a certain number of digits, and you have to tell it in advance how, how big the hole for the digits is. And it had a very precise timer, which uh, timed every one tenth of a second. And now they stored one tenth as a binary digit. That's point zero 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 one one zero zero one one zero. It's a repeating decimal, just like one third is. And they topped it off after 24 digits and stored it in a 24-digit hole. And then they let the Patriot system run for 100 hours. The error in chopping it off after 100 digits is about 1 on 100 million. And if you work out the number of tenths of a second in 100 hours, it's about 30 million. So that means that the time was a third of a second off. Scud missiles tra travel at 1,500 metres per second, and so the Patriot missed it by 500 metres. 28 people died and 100 were injured as a result of that simple mathematical and data error. I've got another one, Ariane. They spent $7 billion and uh, a decade designing Ariane. No, not that Ariane. Ariane the rocket. Oops. Are you going to make that work? Yeah. Here is Ariane the rocket going up. It was an unnamed European Décollage. rocket. Ariane 5. Decollage means blast off. There she goes. And. Five hundred million euros that rocket was worth. Do you know what they did? They tried to put a 64-digit number into a 32-digit hole. So it lost track of where it was. My third example is not a bit less dramatic now. You can start the video now. Um, this is a cyclone off the Australian coast. So can you see the cyclone approaching the coast? It's at about Fiji now. And um, the Met Bureau guys are trying to guess where it's going to cross the coast because they need to tell people to evacuate. As it gets closer and closer, they are trying to figure out. Now, unfortunately, even though the equations for predicting where the weather will go are very precise, 100 metre difference at Fiji can make 200 kilometres difference as to where it crosses the coast. So when it finally hits the coast, which is about now, they were not able to predict where it would hit until just before and to evacuate um, the small town of Port Douglas where it hit. Thank you. That was Port Douglas before, and this is Port Douglas after. And again, if we'd had better and more precise maths, we probably could have predicted where it would have hit and cleared the Port Douglas area more reliably. So these are some very good examples of maths, we have a danger of death by failing if we don't do our maths right. So let me talk about computers and data. That's what my talk is really about. Are they a dangerous mix? This machine has no brain. Use your own. <laughs> do you remember, computing has grown an amazing amount over the last um, 50 years. In fact, in 1965, um, Moore's Law suggested that we would have a thousand times more data in a decade from 1965. Actually, twice each year, 2 to the 10 is uh, 1,024, which is about 1,000. So in a decade, we'll have 1,000 more 
times computing capacity. That, that law has continued to hold every decade since 1965. Every decade. So we've got a thousand-fold increase. This is what the old disk drive. Remember the old disk drive? Maybe you're too young to know it. That's what it looks like an old car now. And so um, by now we are measuring, we are measuring um, information in petabytes. Petabyte is a thousand to the fifth or ten to the fifteenth. It's a fifteen-digit number. That's the amount of information we have. Uh, we measure our, our, our things in the world with. How much is a petabyte? Well, they compute that the human brain is about 2.5 petabytes of memory, if you could condense your memory into digital somehow. Uh, or alternatively, an MP3 player, if you played uh, a petabyte of songs, it would last for about 2,000 years. So therefore I calculate that if you somehow put your brain into an MP3 player and played it, it would last for 5,000 years after you died. Try telling that to your children. <laughs> um, and it's not, it's big businesses seeing this data thing as a, as a way of making money. It's, it's, it's been a fantastic um, opportunity for big business. They, they've tried offshoring, <coughs> they've tried, they've tried um, all kinds of things. Through, the competitive pricing has driven their prices down and they've tried many, many ways of uh, reducing their costs and they can't do it. Now they're really flat to the boards and they see date, their data sets as a way that they have of making more money. So big data is, was introduced by McKinsey's, I think, to try and sell their data and analytics services. Um, what is big data? Nobody can quite tell me. It does have four properties, though. It's got volume. That means you need to have a very big computer in your organisation to store it. It's got velocity, which means it, it comes in so fast that you can hardly understand how fast it's coming and you need data scientists to look after it. It's got variety, which means it's not just coming from the traditional sales um, figures, but it's also coming from Twitter, it's coming from Google Earth, it's coming from all kinds of sources and you need to cope with these different sources. And it's got veracity, which means, means you'd better believe it. <laughs> so. Here are some graphs, uh, the US uh, magazines, Forbes magazine and so forth, produce graphs showing you just how much money you can make from big data. I'd like to share this graph with you. It's a graph, so I'll introduce it slowly. There's the cumulative cash value, that's the bottom line that business really wants to know about over that side. And here's the time scale in months there. So I'll show you two curves. That's a red dotted curve without big data. And that's a blue curve with big data. All right, you say, you're a mathematician, show me what the scale on the axis is. That scale on that axis is millions of dollars. So you can see the red one seems to end up about 50 million and the blue one about 150 million. What's the time scale? 36 months. So obviously people in boardrooms see that kind of graph and think little dollar signs come in, on in their eyes and they think we need to make money <coughs> out of our data. So it's very important for business. Um, it's not just businesses that are using it. Um, CERN, for example, um, when they were looking for the Higgs boson, boson uh, looked at 8 trillion collisions and collected 200 petabytes of data. They have so much data in real time that they have to throw it away. Um, Jodrell Bank 2 is looking for the theory of everything and the origins of the universe. They are going to collect 268 petabytes of data per year when they get up and running. Even the National Health, bless them, is trying to collect big data. So they're trying, they would like to do a human genome sequence for every patient. This is the, their long off dream. Uh, every patient, so that instead of going to the doctor who says, oh, on average, guys your age require to go on statins, they'll look at your particularly genetic profile and they'll say, with your genetic profile, you should have such and such a dose. So they'll need to collect 200 petabytes of data and hold it in order to be able to do that. So there are lots of um, new mathematics that have been used to try to describe this. Um, typically, we start with a data set. What might be a data set? Imagine having all the heights and all the weights of the British population on two axes, and you put a dot whenever somebody with that height and that weight there. So you've got 60 million dots on a 
page, you'd like to understand what, that, what the structure of that data set looks like. Um, mathematics can help you. Data sets can be incomplete, inaccurate, uh, and uh, redundant. So you can have the same data stored over and over again. It can have holes in it. Um, mathematics can help fill that in. You can use numerical analysis to fill in the bits between the data. You can use probability to sample some of the data so you don't have to look at all of it. You can use um, um, probability techniques to get rid of the redundant um, data. And also you can use geometry and topology to try to understand the structure of the data. And I'm going to be talking about that in a little while. Uh, some of the best maths from the last uh, 50 years have really come into their own in handling data. So fractals and chaos. There is a cabbage, for example. If you look at that cabbage and then you hone in on a small bit, it kind of looks the small bit looks kind of the same as the big bit, except it's a much finer scale. And then if you were to hone in on a teeny bit like that, it will look the same again. So this cabbage is kind of scale invariant, but if you tried to just chop it up into little bits like a computer did uh, does, then you wouldn't see that scale invariance anymore. So you somehow want to deal with different scales at the same time. That's something that mathematics has really been studying. My next one? Oh, yes. So I'd like to talk to you about the theory of barcodes by Robert Grist. No, not this kind of barcodes. That's a good, lovely slide. It's, that's art, I think. Um, Robert Grist, there's a picture of Robert Grist. He's a slightly <coughs> mad mathematician from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, there he is thinking about the blue-eyed islander problem. He's got one of his eyes taped shut with blue tape. I don't know what that problem is and I don't want to go into it today. But uh, with my Bell's palsy it made me think uh, that he might be a kindred spirit somehow. <laughs> so here's a data set. What I'd like to do is I'll, I'd, like, what, what, here's, I'd like to show you a new way of understanding the structure of data sets which is quite different from anything that's been done before. This is typical of some of the new approaches that are coming up. I'd like to blow up all the data points like balloons. I'm going to make them bigger and bigger. So can you see there I've put circles around them. And I'm going to make the radius of those circles a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And so you can start to see as you draw the circles you get structure coming in. You get little holes. At the end one they've all joined up in one big blob. So let me show you that again and I'll show you what I mean by structure. See those six circles there? They make a hexagon, so I'll represent them as a hexagon across there. And now there are four circles there. They make a little quadrilateral, so I'll join that on. I'll keep doing this. There's a triangle up there. Drawing the triangle, but they actually all overlap and cover it up, so I'll colour that triangle in. There are three down there, so I'll put those. So they're joined up, join them up. A couple there, I'll join them up. Three ones down there that are not connected to the other ones. And then there are the isolated points. Can you see what I've done? I've just drawn the circles and I've joined them up with lines. Mathematics is very good at calculating things, how many holes there are, how many connected bits and so forth. That's the kind of thing we've been doing well for the last 50 years. So let me do that with that radius of circle, then with a slightly fatter radius of circle, then with a slightly fatter radius of circle. And I'll just make them fatter and fatter and fatter. And by the end, they're all joined up and there's one blob. But in between, there are certain points where the radius gets big enough that you can actually see some structure there. So the, the grist barcodes, which are not the same as the barcodes you find in the supermarket, actually they look a little bit like bubbles, don't they? So this is a good contact with my initial bubble picture. Here's, here are some grist barcodes. And those barcodes, those co bars there, describe the structure of the data. Let me describe to you how. I'll start from the right and go across to the left, which is slightly un unconventional. There's the blobby one all joined up. And we represent that as one dot because there's one blob. There it is. There's another one. Also, that's all joined up. That's a slightly smaller radius. Now, something interesting happens here. First, there's still one blob, but there's also uh, like a hole there, so I'll put a green thing there. And there's also inside, uh, there's, there's a, that, that big square's got solid sides all around it, so I represent that 
as something in H2. So there's H0, H1, H2. These are called homology groups, so stuff that mathematicians have been computing since about the 1950s. Now let me keep on doing this. If I do this... So the top one's just the number of connected bits. You can sort of see that I've just grabbed that. So that's how you create these barcodes. And they're representing, as I increase the, the amount of approximation, what's the structure of the thing. So this, um, what we're trying to do actually is use what the human brain perceives as a proxy for mathematics. We're trying to do mathematics that will think about data, look at data in the way the brain does. brain looks at those things and says, oh, look, there's a hole there. Look, and there are four joined-up bits. They don't necessarily do it like the traditional computer does. People are obsessed with the brain. Look, this is just in a random bookshop. Look at all those brain books. Um, Grist himself is an uh, AI, um, artificial intelligence scientist, uh, working between maths and um, computing. So... What's happening is, in order to understand this data, there's a lot of maths going on, and we need, as there's more and more data, to understand better how to analyse it. And maths is starting to do this. Maths is very hidden, though. You don't actually see maths. That's my conclusion. You don't actually see maths. It's a fairly hidden thing. Um, at the same time as maths being incredibly important like this, fewer and fewer people seem to be doing it at A-levels, and more and more people seem to say, oh, I'm math-phobic, I can't think about that. I think this is not a very good state. Uh, I and my maths colleagues, there's, a, there's been some, actually, um, there's been some uh, press about the evils of data and how it's going to subsume the society. We don't feel that, my, I and my math colleagues. We, aren't, we feel we have a control over the, how, how the algorithms are working. But, uh, but uh, I think what we need, really need is to have more and more people understanding more math and feeling less paranoid about it. So that's my, that's my takeaway message from today. And here's a summary of my talk. Thank you very much indeed.